This is the video. This is where I'll be next year. We are gospel-centered art with one vision, mission. In schools, on stages, on the streets and in prisons. We are a movement of the unashamed, untamed, unconventional, unshaken truth that has one name, Jesus. We are kingdom community spout one word, Eden. My catch us in an office building nine to five, then on the corner of your neighborhood five to nine. Cause this is more than comfortable living, it's 24 seven life online. It says, I will live for this cause rather than mine. We are broken people with a united cause, an undivided love and a divided society proclaiming Jesus is Lord. More than performances for applause, we are community to the fractured and the poor. Where ex-drug dealers find freedom in Christ, where suicide runs to hide, where death turns to life, where the local thief becomes the urban hero, where 100 crimes become zero. We are transformed lives, transforming lives. We are God-shaped enterprise, where ex-prisoners and addicts find their home and become more than ever dreamed or hoped. Because in a world saying, I can't do it, we say, yes you can. You can take a stand, find who you're meant to be, discover your identity in the maker's plan. Cause we won't sit back whilst the generation dies. We advance through your city proclaiming real life. We train up the next generation to effectively proclaim Christ. We are a movement of laid down lives refusing to hide. We go beyond music and take people higher. We're not about fame or being admired. From the ones and twos to venues filled with thousands, we are unashamedly proclaiming Jesus. This is more than a job. We're born for this. We're called to this. To every tongue, race, face, and nation, we are community transformation, equipping identity proclamation. We are conveying the gospel with word and action, transforming lives, calling the next generation to rise. We are the message. So that's where I'm going next year. See you later. <laughs> yeah, so a little bit about the message they work with. Isn't the top 2%? 10%? Oh, yeah, Eden. So there's different groups that they have within them. So they have uh, something called the Eden Group, which work on the top 10% of the most de deprived estates in the UK. And then, uh, yeah, there's a, a thing called Community Groceries as well, which started, was it in lockdown? Yeah. yeah, obviously when people couldn't afford meals and stuff, especially in the deprived estates, they were helping them as well with that. All right, love the, the next slide. <laughs> so yeah, what does this mean for me? I'm gonna be living in Manchester from September the 9th. Um, so yeah, I'll be living with uh, about six other people in my house, but I think there's gonna be about 40 people on our course, which is ridiculous. And they come from all over, so all over Europe, all over, like everywhere. I think there's a, there's a girl coming from somewhere in Africa yeah. where there's a, um, she got her, she became a Christian and her dad said, if you don't, so don't stop, if you stop doing, don't stop doing that, we'll chop off your legs. So she just ran off, started in a live group, and then now she's going to come over and come on this course. So I'll be on with people like that who like go through mental stuff. But yeah, so uh, as you can see, I've done obviously a bit of worship up here, but I'm going to like properly go under like proper 10 months of training and, and like learning my craft. So that'll be good. And then uh, I'll, find it out, I'll be finding out what God's put over my life, what, what he has for me. Because uh, I remember, I'll tell you this a little bit, I was going to join the RAF, I think some of you knew about that, but uh, I hit a few hurdles and stuff, and since then, like, I thought, oh, I've got nothing, I don't know what I'm going to do, I've just gone, God, wherever you need me now, I'm just going to go, so I'm just literally just going, you take me, take me wherever you, wherever you need me, so this is, this is where I'm going to go to find out what the next step is, or the next few steps, but yeah, and so I'll be going in a lot of schools, uh, working with local communities and prisons which I'm really excited for because in my A-levels I did about criminology and I've seen the injustice in the system and how it's set up to fail people like I, something needs to be done about that but so it's gonna be amazing doing that as well and uh, I'll get to tell my testimony as well a lot throughout which I think I've got a powerful testimony with what I've been through and how God protected me and stuff so yeah we're good next slide please so yeah when I'm going 9th of September I will be back as well, yeah, every so often. I think it's opposite holidays to here, 
It's yeah. opposite holidays to here, but I'll be back the occasional yeah. Sunday and stuff. Every first Sunday, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Every, yeah, when the food's about you. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll be back. And then uh, in May or June time, I get the option to go abroad for a week. Uh, so it could be to places like uh, Brazil, Kenya, Germany, or when mum doesn't want me to go to South Africa because she knows I'll go in the prisons and they're a bit, a bit dodgy. <laughs> oh, yeah, you got the next slide, please. Uh, so, yeah, for this course, this isn't a pyramid scheme, all right? <laughs> uh, I'm going to need to raise money for the course fees. So, I need to raise about £2,800 for it. So, this will cover my, the house, the bills, uh, and the course fees, and obviously the training that I'll get as well. And can I have the next slide, please? Uh, I've also got, uh, I have to raise money for a monthly allow allowance as well. So this is for like me to live off so, like food, water, and <laughs> all the, the essentials, yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's, it's not like, this, this part of the giving isn't just about the money. This is about like you joining me on, on the journey that I'm about to go on. I know that sounds better stood here and saying, yeah, yeah, give me the money, but it's not. <laughs> and, <laughs> And uh, like, I, I want to get like all your like. If you give, no matter whether it's just a one time or if it's like a monthly time, I want I want your emails, I want your phone numbers, yeah. so I can uh, keep in contact with you all and tell you like what's going on, how I'm doing, yeah. where your money's going. Because this money isn't just just for me. This is for me blessing other people as well. Yeah. And yeah, if you so if you if you want to do the monthly stuff, then just either speak to me or mum about that. Mm -hmm. But uh, with the other one, uh, the one time there'll be I think mum are you gonna post it in the yes. WhatsApp group the little link. Yeah, can I have the next slide. So I'm not just gonna tell you quick give me money. We're gonna do fundraising for it. So uh, me and Pastor Johnny who isn't here today, but when he comes back <laughs> I'll speak to him. <laughs> We're gonna to attempt to walk the three peaks. Are we doing it one time? Yeah yeah, one go. So that'll be good. Uh, I've had a word with my mates, uh, we're going to attempt to walk a marathon, we'll say attempt, we'll, we'll do a marathon walk in a day, and then uh, we're potentially going to walk 76 miles and do a few wild camping spots as well, and there's other stuff as well that will come, but, so I'm going to be doing a bit of fundraising, which obviously will keep, keep you informed with what's happening and stuff over summer, but yeah, uh, yeah, can have the next slide please? So yeah, that's the, well obviously you can't copy, that's a long link, but mum, mum will put that in there, in the WhatsApp group and yeah. So yeah. And oh yeah, if you can please share. So then all your friends and your friends of friends and your friends, cats, dogs, friends, mum can uh, uh, know what's happening. But yeah. So that's that's where I'm going next year. That's what I'm doing. I'll be back. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Thank you very much. And as uh, someone who's worked for The Message, I can tell you they are the real deal. They are awesome, awesome people. And you're going to have an amazing time. And I'm trying not to think about it. Yeah. So, oh, do you need to move it down? Yeah, yeah. That's it. Is that better? Come Sarah here. Sarah's not here. Oh, she's there. <laughs> I will look directly at you the whole time. <laughs> um, when I was uh, praying about what to what to preach about. Jake just said, just, just preach on something that you know about or that you need uh, and it'll all be okay. So um, that's why we're doing what we're doing today. I'm going to be preaching about known and healed. So those that love a title, it's called known and healed. I'm just going to pray. <coughs> Lord, I thank you for your presence here. Lord, I thank you that you're with each and every one of us. Lord, I pray that you'll use me in these next few moments, Lord, just to speak directly to these people here. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Okay. So anyone who knows me knows that my favourite part of the Bible is Psalms 139. I love it so much. It tells so much about who we are uh, and God's plan for our life. It's literally my go-to thing. Uh, I've been through lots of different things which you probably, uh, most of you know about in the past uh, and one thing I've always struggled with is my identity. Who is my identity in God? I'm going to read you a couple of verses. So Psalms, obviously I'm going to start with Psalms 139, verse 16 says, You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. 
Jeremiah 1, 5 says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. And Zephaniah 3, 17 says, The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves you. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. How amazing is that? The Bible is full of these. I was once told there was 365 promises in the Bible, one for every single day. So if you're feeling a bit wobbly, open your Bible, just open your Bible. Uh, so I want to talk about two people today who knew Jesus. Uh, Jesus knew and healed them. One was healed of something that he never knew he had, and one was healed of a physical illness that she knew that she had. For those that are leading house group, I've got notes as well, so don't panic. Okay, so I'm going to read. I'm reading from the Passion Translation at the moment. I'm, um, my Bible readings, probably for the last few months, have been through. I've been going through the Gospels and the Passion uh, Translation. It's beautiful to read familiar passage with a different translation. So this one is uh, Jesus and Zacchaeus. So this is Luke 19, verses 1 to 10. In the city of Jericho, there lived a very wealthy name, a man named Zacchaeus, who was a supervisor over all the tax collectors. As Jesus made his way through the city, Zacchaeus was eager to see Jesus. He kept trying to look at him, but the crowd around Jesus was massive. Zacchaeus was a very short man and couldn't see over the heads of the people. So he ran on ahead of everyone and climbed up a blossoming fig tree so he could get a glimpse of Jesus as he passed by. When Jesus got to that place, he looked up at the tree and said, Zacchaeus, hurry on down, for I am appointed to stay at your house today. So he scurried down the tree and came face to face with Jesus. As Jesus left to go with Zacchaeus, many in the crowd complained, Look at this, all of the people to have dinner with, he's going to eat at the house of a crook. Zacchaeus joyously welcomed Jesus and was amazed over his gracious visit to his home. Zacchaeus stood in front of the Lord and said, half of all that I own I will give to the poor. And Lord, if I have cheated anyone, I promise to pay back four times as much as I stole. Jesus said to him, this shows that today life has come to your household. For you are a true son of Abraham. The son of God has come to seek out and to give life to those who are lost. Oh I say Zacchaeus. I don't know about anybody else. But anyway, that's, that is my way to say Zacchaeus. Uh, there's four things that we know about him. He was a tax collector. He was wealthy, probably because he was skimming off the top of, to line his own pockets as well. It says there that he was a supervisor of all the tax collectors as well. He was short. I don't know why that's really a problem. But anyway, as someone who is short, uh, and he wanted to see Jesus, he knew there was something really special about him. So Zacchaeus probably didn't choose his career. In those days, you would usually follow the, the, um, your father's step, uh, footsteps and the jobs that they did. So Zacchaeus would have seen him as he, is, as he was growing up. He would have seen his father in his work. He would have seen him caught, uh, cursed and scorned and spat upon in the street for doing his job. Tax collecting was probably one of the worst jobs you could do. Uh, it probably still is now, actually. But, uh, but back in those days, it was like super not very nice at all. He would have learned how to protect himself as well, to make himself hardened to his surroundings, to protect himself. He would have heard everybody else shouting at his dad. He would have been taught the family business and the perks of the job and, and how to make it worthwhile. And he probably would have allowed himself to wear the label that society had given him of the scum of the earth. As the Bible says here, it says um, that uh, why, oh, where is it? Uh, or, uh, uh, that he's a crook. Look at all the people he's going to go and eat, eat with a crook. Zacchaeus' name actually means pure. And I wonder how, how, at what point he forgot the meaning of his name. Uh, obviously, um, those that have children, you know that naming your child is really, really important. Uh, I prayed lots before I named all of mine. Uh, Isaac's name, sorry Isaac, actually means laughter. Uh, when he was a, a baby, he was, <coughs> he was not laughing. He was like the worst, most miserable child. And I would say to him, Isaac, 
Your name means laughter. Laugh. <laughs> Fortunately, now he is actually probably the most funniest child that I own, uh, which is really lovely. <laughs> no, it's true. But names have power over us. Yeah. Then Zacchaeus hears the name of Jesus. He would have heard stories about Jesus and miracles and maybe even heard some of his teachings. He knew he was different. The Bible tells us that Zacchaeus was desperate to see Jesus. But instead of running and pushing through the crowds, he climbed a tree. Yeah, he was short. But I wonder if him being noticed by people held him back. And I wonder how many times you've been held back from a miracle healing or a prophetic word because you didn't want people to see you. I grew up in a, in a Christian family uh, and um, I've told my testimony lots before, um, but, but as a teenager, being like going to church is a bit weird and definitely in the 80s it was even like weirder. Uh, and I had a mum who was desperate for us all to be saved. So anytime we would show any emotion or like put a hand up or like wipe her eyes, she'd be like, well, it's God been speaking to you. Has he been speaking to you? I would so be Zacchaeus. I would be in that tree like, I want to see Jesus, but my mum can't see me. <laughs> so as I was reading this, knowing how Zacchaeus felt, how the world made him feel, how people around him made him feel, actually, was it no wonder that he went up into the tree to see Jesus? He climbed. He was so desperate to see Jesus. And then Jesus stopped. He saw him, he named him, and he went home for tea with him. He probably just didn't get home for tea, he probably actually went and stayed overnight there as well. The shame of who he was and what he had done melted in the presence of Jesus. And being seen and known in that moment transformed him. It was actually a miracle healing that Zac Zacchaeus probably didn't even know that he needed that label of shame that was so stuck to him. He probably wouldn't have even known. He just knew that he needed to be in Jesus' presence. Uh, in the Street Bible, which is not a legal version, but I'm going to read a bit anyway, because Johnny's not here. It says, um, Jesus in his excitement says, liberation makes house calls. Whatever you lot think, this guy is also a distant relative of Abraham. This is why I'm here to track down the missing persons and reintroduce them to life. The street Bible says Jesus was excited. He was excited. And Jesus is excited to heal and to, to really help you know that you are known by the one who's created us. So that is Zacchaeus. The second one I'm going to talk to you about is uh, found in Mark chapter 5 and verses 25 to 34. Um, I'll read this one from the, uh, the Passion Translation again. Now in the crowd that day was a woman who had suffered horribly from continual bleeding for 12 years. She had endured a great deal under the care of various doctors. Yet in spite of spending all she had on, on treatment, she was not getting better but worse. When she heard about Jesus' healing power, she pushed through the crowd and came up from behind him and touched his prayer shawl. For she kept saying to herself, if only I could touch his clothes, then I know I will be healed. As soon as her hand touched her, him, her bleeding immediately stopped. She knew it, for she could feel her body, body instantly being healed of her disease. Jesus knew at once that someone had touched him. For he felt the power that had always surged around him had passed through for someone else to be healed. He turned and spoke to the crowd, saying, Who touched my clothes? <coughs> His disciple had answered, What do you mean, who touched you? Look at this huge crowd, they're all pressed up against you. But Jesus' eyes swept across the crowd, looking for the one who had touched him for healing. When the woman who had experienced this miracle realised what had happened to her, she came before him, trembling with fear, and threw herself down at his feet, saying, I was the one who touched you. And then she told him her story of what had just happened. Then Jesus said to her, Daughter, because you dare to believe, your faith has healed you. Go with peace in your heart and be free from your suffering. Amazing story. I once went for a, an interview in a church 
and they asked me to um, to do a, a kid story on on the healing um, of a little girl that it, that it then goes into and they missed out this huge big, big chunk uh, about the woman that was healed as well and I'm like I'm quite clearly going to preach on that one as well. Uh -huh. <laughs> I got the job. <laughs> uh, we know three things about this lady. She had suffered a great deal. She had spent all that she had and she was getting worse. And unlike Zacchaeus, her, her need was a physical one. She physically needed healing. 12, uh, 12 years of bleeding meant that she had been continually separated from her community. She was unclean. Uh, in Jewish law, I was going to point to Lisa at this point, but I'll point to Len, uh, because you're reading through the, the Old Testament. Uh, the Levitican law said that uh, menstruating women were ceremonially unclean. They had to have stopped bleeding for seven days before they were then able to, um, to make sacrifices and everything else and be touched. So to bleed continually for 12 years meant that nobody would go near her. And like Zacchaeus, the woman had heard about Jesus. Verse 28 says, she believed if she just touched his cloak, she would be healed. Uh, as a Jewish man, Jesus would have been wearing a prayer shawl over his shoulders that had different kinds of tassels and the beautiful, the amazing historical uh, artifacts because they all have beautiful meanings to them as well. And the blue tassel on the corner, which is probably what the, the woman had touched, represented all the commandments and promises of Jesus, of God even. But she didn't just reach, she didn't just say, excuse me, or climb a tree, or hope to see him. She pushed, and she crawled, and she bumped into people. And people probably were like, oh, I'm unclean forever now. But she did not care. She was totally focused on her goal, which was healing, healing. Uh, when I told Johnny I was going to talk about this, he uh, said that there was a part in the, in the Chosen, I've not seen this part yet, where it physically shows this, this woman pushing through the crowd and what that would have meant. Um, the, the Bible is full of stories about Jesus uh, healing and preaching and what we probably don't ever understand is that they were so, the crowds were so big that sometimes he would, in fact just before this, he would have to stand on a boat because there were that many people there. And can you imagine speaking to 5,000 men and women and, and children all in one go? That's just, without a microphone, that's enormous. That's absolutely enormous. But she needed her healing. She needed her healing. It says in the Bible that Jesus knew instantly that he'd been touched. But he needed her to know that he had seen her. In Acts 5.15, we, we hear the story about Peter's shadow, about how Peter's shadow came across and healed every single person. That same power that was emanating through Jesus was emanating through Peter at, at the same time. There was no more shame, no more pain, only freedom in Jesus' name. Um, one of the reasons I'm reading through the Passion is because of the different kind of footnotes that are on there as well. Um, there's a really interesting footnote that I'm going to read to you that talks about um, the way that she touched Jesus. It says here, many today crowd around the written word, but only those who touch the scriptures in faith receive its promises, just like a sick woman who received her healing. You see, we can read the Bible, we can read it from dusk till dawn. It won't make any sense unless we really allow those words to touch our inner soul until we say, God, your word says this, and we walk in that. That's, that's the kind of faith that she had. And Jesus said, daughter, because you dare to believe your faith, your faith has healed you. Go with peace in your heart and you'll be free from suffering. So I've tried to contrast the two very different kind of miracles there as well. You see, Jesus was moving away from the woman, not toward her. She went to pursue her healing. Jesus was moving towards Zacchaeus as he was hiding in a tree. He was not looking for healing at all, but he was open to, to see the healer. The woman's faith healed her. She knew that Jesus could heal her. She knew that just one touch would heal, heal her. But Jesus, intimately knowing Zacchaeus, 
speaking his name out and his, his, um, Zacchaeus' his open acceptance of his wrongdoing healed the shame that he might have felt, healed all of that stuff that had been stuck to him for years and years and years. But both actually knew that Jesus could heal, but in different ways. They both knew, they'd heard the name of Jesus, they knew that he could do these miraculous things. <coughs> Zacchaeus stayed in the shadows and Jesus called him out. But the woman pushed for her miracle, despite the shame she might have felt from the crowds. So what are you going to do? Are you going to sit like Zacchaeus and just, just wait, just wait and hope that God sees you, that he just passes by you? Are you going to wait for that? And in your waiting, what are you doing? Are you really deeply seeking God in, in his word and standing on his promises? Jesus sees you. Just reach out. Jesus wants us well so we can live life and live life to the full. John 10.10 10 says, I have come to give you everything in abundance, more than you expect, life in its fullness, until you overflow. Claim your miracle. Um, this was a hard one <laughs> to do this week, and I've managed not to cry, which is really good. <laughs> um, but I really believe it's something that we need to stand on as a church as well, that we know, obviously, um, Phil's going to come and talk to us in a minute or two. Um, but there are many, <laughs> don't because I'll feel crying. <laughs> there are so many people that need that inner healing yeah. and a physical healing. So we just want to give time and space for that to happen this morning. Johnny, who's not here, will probably be here, miraculously, <laughs> to pray as well. Uh, and there'll be a bunch of us if you want to come and, and, and be, be prayed for, absolutely. Uh, and just like Peter Shadow, we'd like to bring some of that across as well. Shall I hand it? I know we, uh, we joke about being English and we're not allowed to cry and, and things like that, but... Oh man, yeah we are. <laughs> I fully believe that the woman that was bleeding for 12 years had snot flying everywhere and really didn't care, to be honest. And Zacchaeus was probably like in the tree going, please don't look at me. And God was like, oh Jesus was like, no I see you. And he was like, ah, crying. Let's not be English. Let's not be English about this at all. We're going to um, put some music on. Um, uh, just to help people focus, you might want to just uh, read some scripture, you might want to put your hand up and have prayer where you are seated, you might want to just push forward uh, into this moment as well and come and join Phil at the front. Um, tea and coffee will be at the back as well whenever you're ready. Lord, we just thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that you love us, that you know us, each, each, every single one of us here, Lord. You know what we need before we even know ourselves. And Lord, we thank you that you promise healing for each and every one of us, that you want the very best for us. Lord, I just pray for, I pray for a real bravery today, yeah. Lord, that we'll just really press in, press in and seek you, Lord. Amen. Over to you.